Oh, what's, oh, what's up, Goth Gamer Nation? Uh, let's see what the fuck. It's it's your boy but here with the uh, oh to show you a video about a really cool game. That's right. Sometimes games are good. Here is the video. Disco Elysium is an isometric adventure RPG developed and published by Estonian studio Zom for PC and soon to be released as an expanded edition titled Disco Elysium The Final Cut for PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Xbox Series X, Series S as well, Nintendo Switch and Stadia. You think that's the thing that KFC made? Zom was formed in 2016 by Robert Korvitz, but the idea that would grow into this collective and their first game came about a decade earlier when Korvitz, then a member of a rock band called Ultra Melanol, would become disillusioned with music as a means to reach people. Over a night of, as he described it, heavy drinking and listening to DJ Tiesto, Kurvitz began to conceptualize a tabletop role-playing game, similar to Dungeons and Dragons, but set in a fantastic realist world called Elysium. That certainly shares DNA with retro-futurist subgenres like steampunk, but borrows more from the French Revolution and, oddly enough, police procedurals from the 1970s. Over the course of five years, this setting would be adapted into a novel titled Sacred and Terrible Air, though the book's meager sales would be taken pretty hard. Feeling as though both of his artistic pursuits had failed miserably, Korvitz was convinced into one last job. An even more lofty challenge was presented to him, adapting Elysium into an open world RPG, something that would be pretty difficult even with money and a sufficient dev team, let alone uh, neither of those things. Their initial budget for the game was acquired by one of the writers, Kaur Kender, selling his Ferrari. The rest would come from friends and loans. What they did have already was a lot of artistic passion and a lot of thought put into this bizarre clockwork of influences that somehow manages to feel like a cohesive and new world that is still greatly reflective of the uh, miserable one we're stuck with. It would be several years before they landed on the name Disco Elysium. For much of the production and the initial promotion, it was named No Truce with the Furies in reference to a collection of poems by R.S. Thomas. Eventually, the name was changed because, as they put it, it was a working title and they never intended that to be the final name. But it's also likely that it sounds a lot like No Truce with the Furries, which would have had different connotations, I'd imagine, and perhaps invited an audience they probably weren't targeting. And there's also just the matter that, as a title, it, it's... not good. Why would you name something that? It was conceptualized as a D&D cop show hybrid that would be a modernization and advancement of games like Planescape Torment and Boulder's Gate. See, right off the bat, you're throwing around a lot of goals that seem pretty insurmountable. Like, I'm just reading shit they said right now, and at first it seems really absurd to say, yeah, we'll do a greatly respected and beloved game like that, but advanced. But when you think about it, how often do games like this really come out? You still have RPGs that can weave an interesting story, add little gameplay mechanics or combat quirks, maybe even give it a creative visual style, but there are a lot of unshakable mainstays of a CRPG that developers rarely attempt to shake free from. Clearly, there is a lot we can still do with them. In reading and watching old interviews with Korvitz and other Valm members, you really get a sense for how in love with this idea they are. And I kind of understood that this is our eight mile moment now, you know, mom spaghetti and everything. Uh... Watching this guy talk about this game, the energy is infectious, like he's loving every second of it. Probably because it's the fulfillment of voicing all these things he's been trying to say with other mediums and not getting anywhere. I guess it's just refreshing seeing creators who unabashedly love their creation. And not in this uh, audience pandering way where they think gamers are really gonna like how we've mashed together a bunch of ideas from other games that sold well so, like, mathematically, you have to like it. It feels like they made this game because it desperately needed to be made. It was an idea burning a hole in their skulls. It was an idea burning a... 
the fuck does that- Well, obviously, that Ferrari went to good use. Because those Estonian fellas just cleaned up, robbing them awards, opening a sack and filling it with universal acclaim, sweeping the 2019 Game Awards, whatever that is, and winning Best Narrative, Best Independent Game, Best Role-Playing Game, and Fresh Indie Game. It would go on to win at least eight other awards at different video game-themed events, like three of those were BAFTAs, and those sound impressive, and they just rolled into this immediate success, quickly announcing an expanded Final Cut edition of the game, an English translation of the original novel, and a full sequel in the works. They even announced plans to adapt it into a TV show with the producers of the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. Not that that really, you know, means anything. It's, it's If anything, it's more of a sign of validation. Your thing was good enough that film industry types want to exploit it. Video game adaptations get announced and left in purgatory all the time. Or worse, they come out and they end up like Sonic the Hedgehog. I've seen interviews where they liken their studio to more of a cultural movement. Quite unsuccessful. I like to say fantastically unsuccessful cultural <laughs> movement. Which is a little pretentious, yes, uh, but it's also kind of sweet. I don't know, There, there is an absurdity to comparing the creation of a video game to art collectives like Dadaism and Fluxus. I can see ideological similarities. If you somehow didn't know, Disco Elysium is a very openly political game. Vom has never shied away from this. Like my cop became a communist. Congratulations, comrade. Which I find pretty commendable. Plus they are shaking up genre and retooling the way game design works. So whatever they're doing, it's working. As far as I'm concerned, you, you can call it whatever you want, just don't use the word furries in it. So I guess I should start by saying Elysium, the world the game takes place in, is analogous in a lot of ways to the world we know, but it is very different. It's a planet housing several islands, and in between them is an ocean of achromatic, odorless, featureless space referred to as the Pale, a dark, mysterious plane that is immeasurable and defies any scientific study, and most who enter it either die or return as a shell of who they used to be. But Elysium had something similar to a Middle Ages, a Renaissance, and now sits in a modern era called the new that can somewhat resemble our late 1970s, early 1980s, but it is their 1950s. They have computers and airships using magnetic levitation, as well as a dour Cold War vibe. There are a lot of names and terms that you're gonna have to learn along the way for the different countries, cities, ethnicities, and political factions. I'm not even entirely certain I've retained all of it, so if I miss something, or likely mispronounce something, uh, you know, uh, go fuck yourself. The New is a period that subsists in the shadow of a great war called the Anticentennial Revolution, something that began around 50 or so years prior to this game's setting. Gonna try to keep this brief. Uh, in short, an Eastern European-like nation called Grad, in an eerily familiar sequence of events, experienced a rapidly spreading illness that the government at the time failed to take any action on, thus causing it to become a pandemic, and in the wake of this inaction, the Communist Party led by an economist named Krasmazov, overthrew the government and incited a counter-revolution. Fighting spread to the region Disco Elysium takes place in, Revishal, which was briefly under the control of the communists before they were defeated by the Coalition of Nations, an alliance formed in service to centrist morals with the sole purpose of stamping out the revolution. Under coalition occupation, Revishal became something of a lawless wasteland, as the moralists were much more concerned with mass executions and hunting down holdout revolutionaries, then actually trying to repair the smoldering ruin they made out of this city. The scars of this conflict are plainly seen at every corner of Martinez, the district the game takes place within Revishal. It was once part of a great monarchy that built an economy around exporting marble and cocaine, but it's now dissected into districts under the control of different capitalist nations. There is also an extreme wealth disparity where most are, as they put it, pornographically poor or obscenely wealthy. The coalition purposely left Revishal an untamed mess for a while before forming a police force called the Revishal Citizens Militia or RCM, an often impotent self-organized authority made of mostly volunteers that are more likely to just 
shoot someone than solve a case. Because you're a cop in it, we couldn't have you go around and shoot everyone. That would make a very strong political statement. The district has two police stations, Precinct 41 and Precinct 57, and neither really wanted the responsibility of policing Martinez, as the local dock workers union had become the de facto law in the area. The game opens with our, for the moment, nameless protagonist, hungover and face planted in the middle of a trashed hotel room. Of course, not the most groundbreaking RPG innovation, having you start out with amnesia, but from your environment and context clues, it appears likely that a number of things may have factored into your memory loss. Front and center might be that it appears you've attempted to drink and overdose to death, so he wakes up either having a genuinely concerning lapse in memory, or perhaps he's willed himself to forget due to some psychological trauma. It's a pretty clever source of lore dumps because this guy is truly a blank slate, and you don't Breath of the Wild style unlock these clear recollections. Learning about this guy doesn't restore who he was, he's essentially a new person. I mean, if that's what you've chosen. You can fully embrace the old guy, or you can play into this mask he's built to prevent himself further harm. And from the first interaction, uh, where I thought it would be raffle to random to hit on this woman, uh, and then decided to describe myself as a sorry cop, I realized how that was going to happen, and, and I suddenly felt very nude. During the first hour, you learn that you are a policeman, you're at the Whirling and Rags Hotel in Martinez, you got there a few days ago to investigate the death of a man found hanging in a tree. In that time, you managed to do a lot of drinking and other activities that weren't getting the body out of the tree, questioning people, and so forth. Police work, you might say. You also appear to have lost all the traditional things a police officer usually has on their person, like a badge and a gun. You're pretty sure you used to have those things, though? I mean, it stands to reason. You are soon introduced to Kim Kitsuragi, another policeman from a different precinct assigned to investigate the hanged man, suggesting they act as partners to get the case back on track. It's impossible to say at this moment what, if any, work got done before he arrived, so they sort of start at square one, questioning the hotel employees and trying to get the body out of the tree, which turns out to be one of those things, you know, you never know how difficult it is until, you, until you're presented with it. It sounds easy on paper, but... Like, he's way up there. Like, how you do it? Like, seriously. I'm asking you, I, I need to know. Kim is without question the most likable character in this game. Not the sweetest, though. That goes to Lena, the cryptozoologist's wife, who is just a treasure of a person. Just a sweet old lady that really likes cryptids. For her sake, I really hope they exist. I mean, I, I know they do, obviously, but like, in the game. You know, though there are numerous ways you can play the main character, it's hard to make him anything other than eccentric. And that is part of the fun, indulging in the fantasy of this broken character that can accomplish things with really unconventional or oddball realms of thought. But Kim is such a tightly wound by the book's foil to these antics, so he's always subtly trying to rein him in, and the way that develops is incredibly endearing. The rare moments that you sort of break his exterior and he indulges or appreciates a joke or a comment of yours is it's rewarding in a way I, I don't think I've ever felt within a game until now. He's a good partner and is patient with how much of an inhuman wreck you are, or is at least politely projecting that because he doesn't want things to be awkward. Throughout this game, you meet a lot of initially really unlikable people. People who aggressively do not like you, do not respect you, hate that you're there, stick in your nose where it doesn't belong. Wow. The RCM sent us some big dick cops. Real big dick cops. Look at them, reckless, swinging in the wind. Some are racist and threatening, and that can get in your head and cloud your judgment, and Kim is usually a good sounding board. It eventually came to be a relief when he would chime into conversations because like, oh good, somebody who knows what they're talking about is taking control. Whew. The mystery of the hanged man's death is the trigger for the main storyline, but there are a number of other quests you can complete in between by interacting with numerous characters in Martinez. You can help some cryptozoologists hunt for an invisible stick bug. You can help convert an abandoned church into a rave or even go on a date. These rarely feel completely independent from the main story. They mostly contribute to it even if it's in a small way like revealing some detail about the protagonist or the world. They are also every bit as riveting as the main story, often leaving you with an ambiguous ending, like the quest line where you investigate a doomed commercial district where seemingly no business can last and the one remaining shop's owner is deeply paranoid that there is some dark spiritual 
explanation for it all, but they were really smart about offering you a more logical explanation, but never completely dismissing the fact that we can't know it wasn't something, as the game puts it, supernatural. Conversely, another quest which results in you having to inform a woman of her partner's death is so soberingly real that you just have to kind of squirm in that reality. It's moments like this that really legitimizes the setting and the people. You spend a lot of time playing in this world, finding humor in the protagonist's absurd behavior, but there is this storied sad world beneath it all that is expertly illustrated. There's a lot of good storytelling woven into an already complicated main investigation that often leaves you in the weeds. You never really know when you're being lied to or manipulated by the different figures in Martinez. The death of this man stirs up a lot of tension, lighting the fuse on a city already prepared for some impending violent confrontation. Evidence suggests the dock workers were involved in the man's death, and the dock workers union has been on strike for about a month, while the harbor's owners, the Wild Pines group, haven't budged to their demands. The two representatives you meet both have their own ulterior motives and shady practices, and everyone else who could have information on what happened is either gone or wants nothing to do with you. Because you're cops, and cops don't exactly have the best foothold in this district. There's a lot of disdain for them, especially from the Union, who prides themselves on being sort of self-sustaining. You know, these people have been left to fend for themselves for so long in a depressing shithole, and then the cops show up like they're in charge all of a sudden. Alright, what's the beef? Who's the perp? You're out of order. I'm taking- off. Oh, that sounds like a threat, Cinderella. I'd assume the position, turn around, now. It would be pretty hard to fully encapsulate this whole game story based on my one and a half playthroughs. The story is gonna bend to your playstyle, and you're unlikely to experience the exact same set of circumstances I did. There are several moments in the game that could potentially branch different directions, so I guess I will spoil a lot of plot points in this section. Uh, there's still a lot to this game that I didn't complete and that I wouldn't experience unless I played a different character build, explored different political affiliations, and just got lucky or unlucky with certain skill checks. So if you don't want anything spoiled, go ahead and skip to this time. I do feel like if you're at all interested in playing the game, the less you know about the story, the better, as is the case with a murder mystery, essentially. But also, I want you to watch the video, uh, so it's the quandary I find myself in as a creator of Tube Media. Go play the game, come back, and post your political alignment results in the comments so I can uh, see if I need to blacklist you. Look, I just became a famous bread tuber, so I gotta start making moves now. In fact, I've set up a hotline you can call to submit your results if you don't have a computer and you can't see this right now, um, I'm, I'm still working it out. This is a real phone number though, so only use it if you're serious. Uh, it was very difficult to set up. The guy that did it for me really gave me the runaround, but we got it done. Okay. It's, I'm serious. This is not a bit. It's a real number. Okay, it's five, five, five. Shut up. It's real. Five, 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 five. Now it's gonna do this for a while, but you'll just have to be patient. Uh, we can, we'll, we'll come back to this. The two detectives quickly deduce that whoever the body in the backyard is, he's been lynched by a mob. There is sufficient evidence that this was not the work of one killer. He's pretty much naked save for some ceramic plated boots, which belong to an armor set that only a soldier or mercenary would own. How much you learn from the field autopsy is really dependent on your skill checks, but depending on that you may realize that the man was likely unconscious or dead before he was displayed in the tree. You might also get the sense that he, uh, I guess was in a in a good mood when he was killed you know what I mean like the like the vibe at the time of death was you feel me? For a large part of the game, you'll be going door to door trying to piece together a timeline and fill the gaps in this event that is riddled with gaps. Talking to all manner of eccentric characters, some have very little to contribute to the investigation, but may lead you to learn more about who you once were. These cases within the case that add flavor to the game's world are, as is usually the case with RPGs, sometimes more intriguing than the main plot, but I think the bulk of the game is cleverly bound together in that you're always learning learning something. I didn't often think of the side quests as being independent from the main quest, even if they are technically because you don't have to do them, but they all lend to the fact that you don't know anything about yourself or the world, and you're always 
getting some little piece of that, even if it's not about the murder. Two big figures in town that you'll return to frequently and represent the most likely responsible parties are Everard Clare, the boss of the Dock Workers Union, and Joyce Messier, a negotiator for Wild Pines. Both of them are suspiciously upfront and helpful with you, and clearly trying to win your favor, get you on their side of the strike. Everard can even provide you with your real name, which is, should you choose to accept it, Harrier Dubois, or Harry. There are a lot of moments where you can just commit to who you used to be, or take the opportunity to rewrite the protagonist, and that's really unique and fun. This is entangled in the gameplay, because depending on your skills, these options may play out differently for you. The input that you get from your very talkative skills, the embodiments of your psyche, are going to push you towards certain lines of thinking, or discourage some, and even argue or contradict each other, and this makes for a variety of wonderfully written and darkly humorous exchanges. Once you make it to the other side of town that's been blocked off by a broken bridge, you see the full extent of your drunken bender. By learning that you at one point had a police motor carriage, which is now slowly sinking into a frozen lake, you also learn that at some point you might have been an exceptionally good cop, respected even, but the spiral that led us here started a long time ago, following a substantial heartbreak. Tropey as it may be conceptually, this significant loss for Harry is beautifully depicted and in another move that is so clever it's frustrating, this also serves as a window into a Elysium itself. Frustrating because, like when you think about it, we could probably be writing games this well written all the time. But like we don't. What do we get? We get cyberpunk? I haven't even finished it, but I don't know what it's saying, other than in the future everybody clips through their car and T-poses, and you can become- Harry, in the scrambled eggs of his brain, has personified his ex as a religious, saint-like figure named Dolores Day, and we're forced to bear witness to the way he's weaponized this against himself. It's tough to sit through because there is dreamlike religious imagery to it, but it's also this harsh dose of reality. It feels like a fucking gut punch, and you sort of get how that would be pretty tough to come back from. More poking around reveals the hanged man's death was merely the flashpoint for a greater conflict. He belonged to a squad of mercenaries that Joyce had hired to act as strike breakers, ruthless ex-military types with scary ceramic armor and assault weapons. The Union, specifically a group of vigilante types that maintain order, called the Hardy Boys, openly admits they were responsible for the man's death, confidently ensuring that everyone on the dock had a hand in lynching this guy because he deserved it. And the two detectives can hardly take them all in. None of them want to open up to the police, but depending on the dice, you you can get the Hardy Boys leader, Titus, to explain their side of the story. There are a lot of moments like this that seem revelatory, that make you feel like you're about to get the big piece of the puzzle that makes the picture come into shape, but they put that off for a long time. There is a complicated network of lies and schemes and broken personalities that cloud what should be a relatively simple matter. Who killed this dude and why? And you get caught up in the emotions of it. I felt frustrated and like I was being fucked with by the people here. And that was pretty wonderful. The Hardy Boys were mostly, at best, tampering with a crime scene in order to cover for a woman named Klausia, with her own mysterious motives and history. But that hardly matters when on the surface what appeared to have happened is the Union made their move in this standoff between them and Wild Pines, which might have been the end of it were it not for the gang of psychopaths that turns out, aren't great at following directions and not killing people. This leads to a deadly confrontation between the two groups that could play out in a number of different paths, but ideally you want to defeat the mercenaries and keep casualties to a minimum. But I don't think you can make it out of this encounter without people dying. It's an intense and varied series of visible and invisible skill checks that decide how this pivotal moment plays out. In my first playthrough, I got two really lucky successes in a row and was able to take down one of them and prevent Kim from being injured before Harry passes out from a bullet wound. It could have played out with Kim getting hurt, and I don't, I, I don't know what I would have done had that happened. 
Well, I'd probably save scum until that didn't happen, but you know. I think you do have to sort of surrender to the dice every now and then. There is that instinct to try again, but I think the game is worth playing through once, just committing to your roles. Obviously, there are an absurd amount of variable details that I won't be able to recount, because a bad thing may happen, you miss something that seemed great, but what you'll get, I think, is something equally thoughtful. Something just as worth seeing through, like punching a child. Klausia is an important presence in this story, and one of the most nuanced characters. It's easy for Harry and the voices in his head to connect her obvious guilt to this crime. She's clearly done a lot of things she's not proud of and is burdened by that. And we learn she had an intimate relationship with the hanged man, and he died while in bed with her from a gunshot right in the mouth. She convinced the Hardy Boys, some of whom she had wrapped around her finger, into staging his death to look like a lynching so none of the heat of this investigation would be put on her. But she's not guilty of this crime, and actually has no idea who shot him, and neither does Everard and the Union, though he did try to use this crime to justify their strike by outing the mercenaries as monsters, murderers, and rapists, which they most definitely were, maybe not specifically at this moment, but it's a bad look on Wild Pines. Ultimately, there are many ways the game can end, but the solution to the mystery of who killed the man in the tree, and why, is discovered in the ruins of a communist base across the water. The utter disappointment you sense in many of Revachal's inhabitants, the bitterness of a failed revolution sort of comes to a head when you find an old, half-insane communist soldier. For probably the entire time the mercenaries and Klausia have been in town, he's been watching through the scope of his rifle, until the combination of his hatred for the type of man the mercenary was, and his sexual obsession with Klausia, led him to pull the trigger. And with this singular act, set alight a powder keg that these two factions were just dying to have set off. And he didn't even care about that. His fight's over. It doesn't even count as politically motivated. He's just a forgotten third party that threw a rock at a hornet's nest. And that's indicative of the whole game we've been playing. It's a game that has these stark, unflinchingly real moments, but it also has a ton of weird, unpredictable shit in it. Humanity fucks up a lot, and often gets weird. And like the world in this game, it just keeps going. Well, that happened. I said that. I did that. Now I have to live with myself. In that way, I think the game is largely about failure. I mean, it concludes with a soldier of a failed revolution lashing out against a woman because he couldn't have her. And as optimistic as the ending for Harry can be, his whole journey of self-rediscovery was likely a mask he desperately wanted to construct for himself in the wake of his failed relationship and failing profession. Revachal is a monument to a failed revolution, the skeletons of its conflict half buried under countless failed businesses and abandoned buildings. While I found it fun to play into communism. This world has stamped that out rather extensively, and that revolution failed for a number of reasons, some of which are utterly, stupidly human. And the way people deal with this and grieve for it, or celebrate it, it's not a black and white thing. Even though in the game it is literally uh, depicted as a black and white thing. Uh, it's kind of cool looking. I feel like no matter what ideology you choose to make, Harry, you're almost mocked in a nihilistic way for committing to one completely. For example, communist responses are often these parodic, over-enthusiastic, Soviet knuckle sentiments that seem a little silly. This could likely be because you are hardlocked as a cop, a tool of the coalition, which is a bit paradoxical. But aren't the police a protective force that maintains the status quo for the wealthy elites? Don't you think we ought to attack the roots of social problems instead of jamming people into overcrowded prisons? Look, Lisa. It's McGriff, the crime dog. The Ushanko looks good on him, but you're going to get a lot of side eyes. Harry's politics often feel like a laughable extreme in comparison to the other characters, but he does open that dialogue with them so you can learn and reveal a character, and given that Harry needed the basic nature of reality explained to him just a few days ago, his misunderstanding of every political belief doubles as a critique of them. I think Disco Elysium rather poignantly depicts a world that's bitter about communism's failure and the stagnation that followed that. Everything is the same. The smoke has seemingly never cleared since that moment, and that's pretty frustrating. It took one ancient communist losing his mind thanks to an Insulindian phasmid to have the town at each other's throats again. Every day, the people of Martinez walk by the site of mass executions and fall into the craters left by mortar shells. They are just stewing in that history. I think there is a real nostalgia and aimlessness reflected in that. But I'm not from 
a former Soviet nation. I don't know the devs' life experiences. I don't know what it's like to be raised during that transition. I was born a year before the fall. I didn't know what was going on then. I was probably, I was a little, I was a little bag of piss at the time. You know, like the little, uh, pouches of milk you, you, you get at the cafeteria. I was like that, but with piss. That's what a baby is, right? This is just what I'm interpreting this as, the message I'm getting. It does appear to be Marxist in this way, clearly criticizing the doomsday clock started by capitalism. Even Joyce, you know, old money, who has benefited from this the most, suggests the all-consuming nature of capitalism despite working for the capital. It's like the two millimeter wide rip in space-time you can find in the church. It's just kind of there, always has been, and it's likely going to result in our destruction. Uh. But what are you gonna do? For a while, I was wondering why they decided to make the leader of the union such an equally shady person. He's very helpful and kind to you, but he carries himself like a mob boss and makes you sit in the world's most uncomfortable chair. At first, I thought it was to show that fully devoting yourself to either side of this argument is wrong. Us versus them is wrong. But really, the guy gets shit done. And because of the character build I used, it seemed like he was honest about doing whatever he could to give his people what he felt they deserved. Joyce is complacent, doing monstrous things because that's the way the world works. Whereas Everart is getting his hands dirty to do the right thing. I mean, maybe that's just me self-inserting and being read by the game, but the difference between them it's fucking interesting. I don't even know what I've been saying for like the past 10 minutes. I do think there is a lot of nihilism in the game's writing, but I couldn't say it's all hopeless. The fact that the cryptid you'd been hunting earlier and that Kim gave you so much shit about wasting your time on turned out to be unquestionably real, you can take a photo of it, we both see it, is proof at least that some pursuits and beliefs may yield reward, or if not that, maybe insight. It feels like more of a victory than resolving the crime because the case it's just kind of depressing. Hello? Hello? Oh, hey, I was just trying to submit some Disco Elysium results. I can't. I, I can't believe you're still doing this. Duh, doing what? All this time and you're not getting any better. This is fucking sick. Huh. Wonder what that was about. Anyway, let's give it another try. Five, five. This is the first game in a long time that made me reflect on my feelings about writing and video games. I think I enter a video game with my expectations lower than I thought. I can say I've played games within the last couple years that had an interesting, creative, or powerful story, but there were games I started knowing that they were narrative focused and inhabiting a genre known for excelling at one thing. If something is tagged as a walking simulator and it's a modern setting with a character's name in the title, Title, they're probably gonna try to make me cry and I know I elected to be there knowing that that's why I'm here That's why I bought the ticket. That's why I'm taking the ride But it's borderline criminal that RPGs have in my opinion It's stagnated this long when it comes to writing and it's not even something I felt all that strongly before I played Disco Elysium It revealed this new frustration in me that writing could have always been this good and what have we been doing this whole time? I love RPGs I, I like to think that I'm incredibly easy to please with RPGs and the whole umbrella that term encompasses. But I see now how much we could have been innovating. I don't think any game has made me laugh out loud, lol, IRL, and tear up within the same hour? Getting me to cry in itself isn't all that impressive. There are songs that can do that. There are episodes of Supernatural that have done that. Sometimes it just happens and I don't even know why. For me, humor is hard to pull off in a game. I've laughed at games a lot, but rarely when the game is working to make me laugh. When it's telling me a joke or trying to be charming, I pick up that that's what's happening. I'm not reacting to it as though it were successful. My brain just reads as, oh, this is a funny part. A less broken person would probably laugh by now. Should I laugh? If I wanted to, this could devolve into me just listing off memorable moments. Hey, you know, like, if you say this, this will happen. There are too many of those to recall, so I can only say it's an incredibly well-written game. And not only that, the very nature of it just lends to numerous varied interactions between not only the protagonist and the people of Revishol, but the protagonist and the different facets of his personality. It's a stroke of genius that I only really understood when I saw it in practice. Having the different parts of your brain personified as characters all their own that bicker with each other and chime in to pull you towards specific dialogue choices, you almost forget that there isn't combat because so many of these conversations can feel so tense. It's like you're controlling a brain more so than controlling a character. They could make asking for a sandwich an arduous accomplishment, and they kind of do do that actually. Finally, the insurmountable feeling that comes with basic adult interactions is accurately reflected in some form of media. This is what's going on in my head just 
too quickly to zero in on, but in, in truth, my brain is probably a less complicated machine uh, consisting of on, off, and fucking panic. It's such a curiosity, really, that a first-time developer could write this brilliant conceit for storytelling and then successfully feed a, a very interesting and original story into it. It's a tight detective story at the center of a wildly imaginative world with its own culture and history and aesthetic. And you really get what feels like the tiniest glimpse of it, but only because I wanted so much more of it. I'm sure in reality they feed you an absurd amount of exposition and world building, but I still have so many questions. There's still so much further this could be taken. It's a perfect example of why I love small stories in big worlds. It's a bleak and complicated place where good very rarely happens, but it does and you really feel when there is levity. I know you accomplish a lot in this game, but making Kim laugh or even nod in approval at me uh, was better than making my father proud of me. Of course, I can only speculate. If you've played an older RPG, then the basics of that presentation are here. You are moving your dudes around from an isometric perspective, dragging the mouse, clicking, or using WASD. Reviews and promotional material may refer to it as dialogue heavy, which seems like an odd understatement. The game is dialogue. Everything you do is intimated by dialogue. Every facet of gameplay is in service to dialogue. You start out by either picking from three preset character builds or creating your own. You have four abilities, and each ability has six skills which correspond to a part of your personality. These skills help determine whether or not you pass skill checks, dice rolls, meaning within dialogue you may be presented with the opportunity to roll for a successful use of one of those concepts, but they are also participants in dialogue, each one personified as a little character that is usually helpful, but relying on one too long could lead to some unhelpful and sometimes dangerous suggestions. Some of these are easy enough to understand, like authority and empathy, but there are some more unusual conceptual skills that provide a really unique experience should you choose to funnel points into them, like shivers, which is your connection to the city, and Inland Empire, my personal favorite, which is essentially your spiritual connection to the investigation, your hunches and dreams, the thing that probably drove Agent Cooper to throw rocks at glass bottles. The idea for all this really came from a dream? Yes, it did. You can improve or reduce these skills in a few ways. Leveling up grants you points to distribute to them, but you can choose to waive these points in favor of a thought from your thought cabinet, which is incidentally what I call my bedroom. Is that me? Is that the kind of joke I want to make? Is that what I want out of this channel? I don't know. I'm going to leave this in so you can understand how much doubt I had in that joke. A little behind the scenes for you. The thought cabinet is a mechanic that the lead designer claims almost sank the production as it was such a difficult idea to pitch. And even now it seems kinda... It's like... It's like when you're going about your life one way and then you see a music video in which a pale man in a leather jacket practices with the bow staff in the rain and you just kinda know that something's different now? A new thought has been internalized? The game reads your choices, the avenues of thought you tend to go down, and suggests thoughts, which you can use points to internalize. These can raise and lower your skills and also add other benefits. Internalizing communist thought gives you XP for expressing communist sentiments, but it also lowers your authority and visual calculus skills. If you don't like the result, you'll have to spend another point to forget it. Internalizing thoughts takes several hours, and while it's being learned, you have a temporary effect, which is essentially a penalty of some kind. So you can let one skill take a hit temporarily while you work to hopefully increase another permanently. It's kind of like Fallout's trait system or Civilization's wonders, just more thoughtful. In a lot of ways, Disco Elysium doubles as a personality test, secretly keeping track of your behavior, tallying your political ideology in a kind of mockery of alignment systems. It also analyzes what your capo type is. If you answer things really by the book and ignore some of the more whimsical dialogue choices, you will be branded a boring cop. If you spend too much time apologizing for all the harm you inflicted during your drunken bender, you'll be branded a sorry cop. It's easy to lean on these two in the beginning of the game, and then try to course correct later. I don't want the game thinking I'm boring. I'll show them. It's honestly really clever because it pushes you to do more wild things and shows you that the game's not going to be ruined if you do that. They want you to come out of this polite RPG shell and explore how eccentric and weird things can get. And I feel 
almost pressured to do so when they actually show me a tally of how many boring or sorry things I've said. Like, I don't even think there is technically an in-game penalty for playing this way. It's just a blow to my actual ego. There are several other Capo types like Superstar Cop and Apocalypse Cop, but each one also has an associated thought for your thought cabinet that can be unlocked once you're prompted. There is a day and night cycle in the world, but time only passes while in conversation. This is actually a very considerate compromise. You never really feel rushed. You can smartly manage your time. If you want to go around collecting bottles and cans to exchange for money, you can do that unimpeded. And if you need to kill time until a timed event, you can read a book or play a board game or just talk to people, something I would never suggest otherwise. Thankfully, anything can be fun in a video game, except sports. I think a lot of these design choices are clearly well thought out. There is a clear consideration put into not frustrating the player, but still giving them adequate challenges. You get two kinds of checks, white and red. A white check is something that you can roll for and fail without much consequence. You can improve the skill associated with it, come back and try again. Red checks, however, which are usually tied to some kind of pivotal event, are one time only. You get what you get and that's it. Stats can be altered by items like articles of clothing, unlike, say, Diablo, where you'd pick up a helmet and it would make a strength or defense stat higher, clothing in Disco Elysium can raise or lower skills based on the vibe they give off. For example, you can equip a badass shirt with a fantasy character on it, which will increase shivers and physical instrument, but it will lower authority pretty bad, as it's obviously not something a cop would be taken seriously wearing. Because of the amount of items and their varied effects, there is reason to pretty consistently change your wardrobe around to balance balance your skills for certain encounters. So even the concept of looting is kind of refreshed because you'll want to hold on to all of them for their various effects. One clothing item in particular even talks to you and has a character arc. I felt more for this tie than I did Jackie Wells. You can also indulge in drugs and drinking, which will increase a whole row of attributes but will have negative effects on your health and morale, which can be amended by healing items that can be purchased or found throughout your exploring. All this sartorial and narcotic tinkering with your skills and attributes to overcome things, it feels like a puzzle and not just a loop of pick up thing, swap out thing, sell thing, kill person, pick up thing, swap out thing, sell thing, kill person, pick up thing, disassociate, blackout, wake up, kill person, what time is it? Where am I? Kill person, kill person, kill person, kill person, kill person, kill person. Disco Elysium does not have combat in the traditional sense. What it does have is narrative decision making in scenes of combat, which I realize doesn't sound as exciting as Get Gun and Shoot Man, a thought that, if you're anything like me, just kind of rattles around in your head all day until you distract yourself with video games. You do have these two bars, one for health and one for morale, and you will get a game over if either of them are depleted. Just because there isn't combat doesn't mean you you won't find yourself in situations where you can sustain damage, be it to your body or to your ego, and uh, either can result in death. Your partner acts autonomously, you don't control any aspect of him, and barring certain events, he's probably the only character that's going to follow you around. There are alpha screenshots that imply this wasn't always the case, but giving you only one other party member really allows you to develop an understanding and even fondness for them. There is just an elegance to the way this game plays. They really considered what works about CRP RPGs and what has room for experimentation. And uh, as a fan of crime, I'm very picky about investigation gameplay. Games got really complacent depicting investigative thought as a ghostly plane where you recreate history in your brain and just magically see exactly what happens because you're so fucking smart and cool and you have big muscles. And this game shows you that well-written text and atmosphere can be more interesting by leaps and bounds. Not a single piece of text seems wasted. Even these little thought bubble things that pop up to give you like a blurb of flavor seem vital to the whole experience. But yeah, it's almost like I want to be involved in the investigation and not just watching someone render it in their head exactly as it happened. Would you watch an episode of NCIS if they cold open with a dead body, then some asshole walked up to it, recreated the murder in his head, you see it happening exactly as it did, and then you watch him type up a report on it? No. You'd skip over the mystery, you'd skip over the goth girl, you'd skip over I honestly don't know what the fuck else happens in that show. Vaum.
put a lot of thought into how this game would streamline the CRPG experience, looking forward as much as looking back, trying to innovate and make a text-heavy narrative-driven game engaging and immersive, down to the UI, which for the most part is one of those set-in-stone things. It's like, do you do the Baldur's Gate thing or the Diablo thing with the red and blue globes on either side of the screen? I don't know what they are. They could be flat for all I know. And you know what? They probably are flat. And somebody wants us to think they're globes for some reason. Taking inspiration from modern social media apps like Twitter, something that people instinctively just get and feel comfortable with. I mean, you feel comfortable navigating, not using, of course. If you're comfortable on Twitter, there, there's something deviant and untrustworthy about you. Twitter is like, you know that scene in Star Wars at the cantina? It's like if a racist sex pervert was watching that, all your dialogue appears on the right side of the screen in a bar that you scroll upwards. There is very little of this UI and its design that feels out of place or overthought. The game was made in Unity, and its visual style is accomplished by hand painting over 3D models. So you have these distinct expressive characters walking around gorgeous environments with dynamic lighting and weather effects that still maintain their expressionism despite being alive and in motion. There's a unique tactile feeling to it, in the way you can see the brush strokes and imperfections in it. Like as though it, if I ran a finger across the screen, it would leave a smudge on my finger. And it probably would because I'm a disgusting human being. There are a lot of other art assets that seem just as intricate and intentional, like the character portraits and especially the thought cabinet art. Every thought has a little painting that's actually a cutout of this larger, surrealist kind of Dali-esque, Hieronymus Bosch-ass looking and painting, which in its entirety is hauntingly beautiful even as a separate creation from the game, let alone the visual representation of the game's sort of unifying mechanic. The bow on top of this whole uh, fucker. Voice acting is a lot of fun. Uh, they clearly picked their voice actors very consciously. I think one of the smartest choices here was using musician Mikey Goodman for a number of the more outlandish personalities. There is nothing. Only warm, primordial blackness. If you're not familiar, he was the vocalist for the UK-based progressive metal band Sixth, which has long been a, a guilty pleasure of mine. Guilty only because they tend to be associated with mathcore and gent adjacent bands, uh, which I find pretty cringe. I stand by those first two albums, though. They came back in 2017 and did another one. And... Yikes. So I realize now they were teetering on, on a fence and, and they officially fell over into what I like to call the not good zone. But Sixth was just a showcase for this guy's incredibly wild voice. There's a track off their second album called Mermaid Slur that's literally just him reciting a poem and, and he already sounded like an ancient lizard brain. Are the seagulls hungry still? Did the pond run out of water? Turn into a motorway? Did the forest see itself slaughtered and model to decay? I thought it an inspired touch to have that band's kind of manic call and response vocals used to represent arguing fragments of thought. Moroccan rapper Dizzy Dross plays Measurehead and manages to pull off a very memorable and effective performance as a giant scary fascist. Nobody betrays your degeneracy. Several of the other cast members belong to political podcasts that the devs were fans of, like Chapo Trap House and Red Scare, and they all do a great job. I don't give a shit, I'm fucking done. I'm done mentally. A big part of what made Kim likable was his composed, yet slightly vulnerable voice, and this appears to be the actor's only credit so far, which seems to be the case for a lot of the side characters. Hello, I'm Kim Kitsuragi, Lieutenant, Prison 57. You must be from the 41st. It looks like we had a little scheduling error on Sunday. Saturday too, actually. And I appreciate how diverse and hard to place Martinez is culturally. There is such a variety of accents and people that it makes the place feel like an otherworldly hub. You should throw the rake at him, Kuno! The fuck does Kuno know what a rake is? Kuno's not a gardener! indie rock band British Sea Power provides the game's music, which is very beautiful, melancholic, even meditative at times. Even the track you're likely to hear the most, the one that plays in The Whirling in Rags, uh, which is more upbeat and playful, there is its own kind of sadness behind it.
And it's it's continuously frustrating that every part of this machine works so well together, and I'd be stretching to find something to criticize beyond some weird screen tearing that would pop up often enough to be noticeable. But the soundtrack, like everything else, smacks of defeat. What moments of mirth the score brings are like dancing on a grave. By no means the most lush or complex moment of this soundtrack, but one of my favorite tracks plays when you explore the tops of shipping containers along the docks. It's like a warm, echoey haze of strings and mechanical whirring. There's a percussive rhythm to it that reminds me of a record player needle stuck looping at the end of a song. It's a wonderful soundtrack and earned them at least one of those BAFTAs. And in general, it's a very musical game. The theme of music runs through it, with the protagonist's intense desire to perform karaoke and a group of characters experimenting with electronic music. You'd think with the name Disco Elysium that genre would be present, but I got the impression disco and the way it's referenced in the game is more metaphorical. It doesn't exist in Elysium the way it existed for us, more like it's in reference to something that was big and proud for a brief shining moment and then quickly burned out. It's a period of time and an aesthetic that is instantly recognizable but long dead, and I wish I could say the same thing about new metal, but you know I, I can hear that fucker clawing at the inside of its coffin and I'm, I'm starting to get concerned. Game made by commies and contains subliminal messages. Also, horrible art. Listen, buddy. Oh, that's empty. Listen, not everybody's out to get you, okay? They're just some dudes that made a video game. So you didn't like it, you can move on from there. There's nothing uh, nefarious going on behind the scenes. It's just a thing you didn't happen to like. Relax. Live a little. Go out. Well, don't go out. Stay in. Go to sleep. <laughs> played this game and got a refund after one hour of game time. By far the most boring game I've ever played. Way too much text. Might as well just read a book. Artwork is cringy too. Looks like a coffee stain on everything. No idea why this game won so many awards and why so many people like it. But whatever. Different strokes for different folks, I guess. Do not recommend unless you have a lot of free time on your hands. Oh, Mr. Busy Man's got time to read books or play other games on the company's dime, but doesn't have time for this one. People sure do love this game. I don't. It's just not fun. There's a lot of text, and I love reading, but most of it makes no sense whatsoever. As your thoughts just ramble at you about the mostly, it seems, political and psychology. Matters I, for the most- this is the fucking- fucked most fucked sentence i've ever matters i for the most part have no interest in i would love to solve the murder but the game just seems to not want me to rather make me to do side quests for other people as i failed checks left and right for any other solution to even get the body down oh and also foraging for money to pay for rent fuck it who'd have thought thoughts would discuss matters of psychology it's a real weird choice i, I agree i'm confused by your complaint that the investigation is put off by side tasks because you certainly do solve of the murder okay like that happens i could tell you who done it right now that's like one of the central activities you're working towards but the game is also an examination of this new world that has been invented and this character you're playing who is trying to find himself there is more going on than that murder because that's the way life works. The world doesn't stop because somebody died. It sounds like the alternate RPG you're suggesting is one where you only concern yourself with the end game task. You want a Diablo where you stop dicking around in these other places and walk in a singular path to Diablo. Guys, we gotta stop Diablo, he's gonna destroy the world. All right, let's head on over to him and give him a piece of our mind. Where's he at? He's down the street. <laughs> let's get over there. Reading Simulator 2020. Can I just say that, like, Reading reviews for this game was really demoralizing. It's okay if you don't like this game, but this is not the first time I saw this phrase. Like someone thought this was funny. What does that even mean? How would one simulate reading? It's just reading. It's the real deal. These are words and you consume them with your ability to translate language into thought. If I read this comment as a review for any game, even one I hated, I'd still be this disappointed. It's disheartening to see people incapable of just saying they don't 
get it, or they're not interested, not a fan of the concept, would rather play something else. Instead, they become really reactionary and defensive, like the entire conceit of this segment. It's not good because the people that played it think they're smart because they don't mind reading boring trash, read a book instead. Yeah, like you read. Like you'd pick a book over any game, fart box. The start is rather slow, and you can get kicked back to character creation if you turn off a light. I know. With work, I just don't have the time for a game like this anymore. I don't fucking care about your problems, buddy. If your idea of a good game is to read a novel, then this is the game for you. If not, then play something exciting instead. You know, some people enjoy reading novels. I don't know, just something to mull over. Honestly, I thought it was quite boring. The narrative itself didn't hook me from the start. I think the setting was a huge factor as to why it didn't appeal to me as well. Taking place in a city and time period I didn't recognize or have interest in at all. I asked for a refund because I knew that this was just something I wouldn't enjoy in the long run. What, do you only play games and settings you recognize? That's gotta be awfully restrictive. Not every game is a one-to-one -one recreation of a real place. You might like flight simulators though, that, that might appeal to your geographical impediment. Press the wrong response, game over, and two hours of gameplay lost. What? How can the autosave design be so bad? Who wants to have to replay two hours of dialogue clicks because of autosave design from 1990? Obviously, saving often is solving this, but we have been spoiled and untrained from manual saves as every half-decent game has a proper autosave function nowadays. Rant over! And remember to save often, I guess. Huh, you, you kind of worked out that solution yourself there, didn't you? Overly complex skill system designed just to look impressive, but actually depends only on your luck. This is just another one of those... I can only guess what that curse word is. Replayability game design excuse. Then there is... What? Then there is full of meaningless dialogues that trick you into thinking this game somehow has a larger world but actually does not matter at the end at all. These dialogues are not adding any flavor to the game other than wasting your time and dragging on the short ass actual main plot. Put it in an actual book instead. 3 out of 10. I feel like you're suffering from some kind of de-immersion frustration here and I'm not certain what caused it because you're describing the mechanics of an RPG as if this were some fault in the game's programming. Luck is a big part of of RPGs, and has been since the times when you could only play them with pen and paper. It's always come down to dice rolls. That's why you work to level up the character and tip the odds in your favor. Also, you call the dialogue meaningless and then say it tricks you into thinking the game is larger than it is. I hate to break it to you, but this is in some sense how all games work. Let me put it this way. You know Halo? You seem like the type to know that. See, in those games, you can't drop your weapon and leave the stage. When you look out into the horizon there, it sure looks like there's a whole world out there to explore. But that's an illusion, because the developers only made this area you're standing in to explore and shoot things. When we forget about that, and are tricked momentarily. This is often called immersion, and we want this most of the time. No. No, no. Nope, no. Sorry. When a game brings me to hate all its locations, imitate the soundtrack in a scoffing manner, and has me crumpled in front of my PC whispering, please, can it be over already? It's not a good sign. At first, I was thrilled by the wide range of skills, but to keep it short, the gameplay showed with Jesus fucking Christ. The choices are a freaking lie. It's fun until it shoves you into situations that can't be solved anyhow, and you have to reload your checkpoints like two days back to find a way of playing construction. There's some really nice ideas in game design, but sadly also some of the worst. See, you're not gonna have a good time playing this game if you're trying to constantly win. Some of these checks you're gonna fail, and that's part of it. That's part of what makes everyone's playthrough so varied. I've talked to about five people now, that's a lie, I don't know five people. I've talked to some people now that played this game and their experiences were largely different from each other because we favored different skills and accomplished different tasks. The fact that you've chosen to obsessively cheese your way through this game, in which winning is hardly the point, is no fault of the developers. It's just a regular text RPG without any visual representation. I don't get what's all the hype about. So what's, like, what's going on on the screen right now? If you said, a guy punching a kid, then I got news for you, feller. It's not a game, it's a novel book. Relay boring book. <laughs> Why did, I, why did I say it like that? The dialogues are boring, the story is silly, and I saw it 100,500 times. It's not a game that real gamers. <laughs> you know, I don't really think you've seen this that many times. I challenge that. 
Get, get back to me when you've got that data. Boring, pretentious, artsy-fartsy, non-sensual indie shill game that getting good reviews based on the fact that it's indie game. Meh. Visual is boring, story is cliche, gameplay terrible, and it's scream low budget from all sides. There's a good reason why these low budget indie shill games will never be game of the year nominee. Uh, it's certainly a take. A take that there's certainly no law against having. It's the self-destructive, ostentatious, circumlocutory, nihilistic, preachy, politicized RPG Reddit has been praying for. Ooh woo. What an ironic time to use circumlocutory. I often find the same lot who love games like this looking down on anime-y type games. So let's be clear on one thing. This game is just as much fan service for those nervous about whether their liberal arts degree in Russian lit was a good financial decision, as is some harem anime games. Let's also be clear on point two, giving you the option to wholeheartedly agree with the dev's politics or simply remain silent on political issues is not choice, that is the same choice given to all those in authoritarian regimes, wholehearted agreement or silence. I applaud the devs for taking a position on something instead of having some watered down, taking over the world is widely regarded as a bad move message. But there is such thing as nuance, and this had all the political nuance of Call of Duty's freedom message on the opposite end of the political spectrum, but run through a thesaurus several times and given over to undergrads who specialize in the art of maximizing word count on their essay requirements. <sighs> Surreal mouthful. You know, I'm sensing a lot of shame. It's almost as if you've constructed a straw man in your own image. I don't like this game because the people who would like this game are the exact types that would make fun of me for my taste in horny anime games. I don't know. I hope you can work through this. Like, d do you want to talk about that? Because I feel like this started as a critique of this imaginary person, but now we're talking about this. And it's one of those things like, uh, I, I can't just ignore it. Disco Elysium is an upsettingly good game, and a bizarre anomaly in a withering industry. It's hardly something I can definitively distill into a singular experience because there are so many variables to consider, so many things I'm sure I didn't even experience, and it's strung together with what would on paper seem like a hodgepodge of wildly different things. It's gotta play like a mix of Planescape Torment and Kentucky Route Zero. It's gotta be hard-boiled like True Detective and The Wire, with room for some whimsy like Twin Peaks and X-Files, but also with a political slant like Dashiell Hammett and the Strugatsky brothers. But this is all woven together so confidently, almost brazenly, and to borrow the parlance of a war criminal, it just works. I feel like this game was built with an expectation of failure. I think that made it sort of fearless. The creative curiosity behind it is really endearing. Can you make this work? Can you even do this? In a lot of ways, it feels preliminary to something, which is exciting to think about. It's also just exciting to see someone's unique, complex, artistic vision rendered in a way they're proud of. You have a competent Nancy Drew mystery at the heart of this story, which is really the springboard for learning about our nameless hero and about Revishal. It's a mystery that is tangled up in the history of its location. It's able to have its cake and eat it too, as far as reality and whimsy, bouncing from grounded and procedural to these absurd inner monologues and outlandish characters. There's a dude named Fuck the World, and another named Idiot Doom Spiral. There's a guy called the Crab Man that lives in the rafters of a church. There's some weird shit in this game, but it knows when to behave itself, I guess you could say. It knows when something is unavoidably sobering. It's also commendable that it even bothers to commit to a depiction of political ideals and makes them part of the game instead of tiptoeing around them or just putting an extra emphasis on certain words and widening your eyes. Man, this fictional corporation really has too much power. Someone should really make an inquiry. And you know, the bad reviews are right. There's a lot of reading in this game. This is how most of the gameplay is related to you, and I suppose you have to be open-minded about that, but I think if that's your main complaint, then the entire concept of its gameplay is, is going to fail, and there isn't much that can redeem that. It uses dialogue in the place of combat. That's the arena in which you're rolling the die. This is where you can fail and die because of words. You're either on board or you're not. The final cut update, which is not out 
at the time of this video, will include voice work for not just some of the conversations, but all of them, which you could wait for, but I feel like you'd still be rubbing up against that same problem. Words will still be the focus. They'll just be read to you. This is actually something I'm, I'm honestly a little concerned about when I feel like I should just be excited. It's good that they're getting this opportunity, but I don't know how much I like the idea of the whole game being voiced. I suppose that's a testament to how much I enjoyed Disco Elysium that I'm skeptical of any attempt to alter it. I like that there are parts you just have to read in silence at your own pace. I could just be worried about nothing and this is solely a positive thing, but I'm partly afraid something will be lost when the reading is taken out of your hands. But then again, worrying about nothing is like the name of my autobiography, or really worrying about nothing until I have something to worry about. Wa waiting to worry. I'm still workshopping it. Oh, man was not meant to speak that long. Jesus. Hey, uh, are, you, are you still there? Thank you for watching my video. Uh, engage with comments and likes and subscribes, please. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Uh, become a patron. Uh, access my... Join my Discord. Purchase things like music and shirts in the description. I'm getting better at this. Uh, ordinarily at the end here, I would read off all my patrons, but I feel like I kind of already did that this month. Uh, so once we cross over in the next video, I will do January names. Um, so don't think I'm, I'm, I'm letting you get away. Uh, but thank you very much for all your support uh, to all my patrons. Uh, being a patron, very important considering, uh, I guess YouTube doesn't want to let me do these supernatural videos and uh, get ad money for it. That's fine. I'm still, I'm still gonna do it because my passion for that stupid TV show is too strong. It's too strong to be stopped. Unless they give me a strike, then I'm gonna stop. But for now, they can take the ads. I don't care. I don't need them. All I need is you. Desperately. I uh, hope you're doing okay, though. I'll, uh, I'll wrap up this incredibly long video so you can get back home and get back to whatever you were doing. Hey, you're something. I appreciate you. Stay safely, goth. And safely gaming. I like to watch. Yeah.